A very warm welcome to all of you and to our webinar today focusing on COVID-19 in the US and its possible impact on the upcoming elections, public perception of how the government, especially Donald Trump, has handled the crisis and how good or bad America looks in comparison with other nations hit by the corona crisis around the globe. My name is Rudiger Lenz. And I have now the pleasure and uh, the pleasure and joy to welcome Carol Doherty from the Pew Research, uh, from the Pew Research Center in Washington. Carol, are you on? I am on. A very warm welcome to you. Good. Thank you for having me so much. Uh, he is the director of policy research and provides regular analysis of public opinion in politics for domestic and international news outlets, as well as for governments, for academic and business groups. And he, as I am, was a former journalist working for the Congressional Quarterly, as well as for CBS. It's good to have you and thanks to Pew for collaborating with us on this very important and very interesting subject, which is so much interesting for especially the European and German public. So now let me also say, this is especially interesting what we are doing today because I think America as we are is hard hit by the coronavirus, but how they have been answering the crisis, how the public perception about the crisis and what that means for the leadership as well as for the upcoming presidential uh, election that might be very different and also very interesting for us as Germans. So Carol, we are very much looking forward to your insights. We will have a couple of slides up front, which will be the basis of what we will then discuss together. And uh, now with no further ado, Carol, the floor is yours. Very much welcome. Thanks for having you. Okay, well, I just want to describe a little bit about who we are and what we do. We are a nonpartisan, non-ideological research institution that covers, covers a number of areas, um, in, you know, policy areas and uh, political data, public opinion data, uh, non-survey data, big data. We do all kinds of data analysis in a, in a nonpartisan fashion. So I wanted to get that out of the way um, it, it quickly, but I wanted to move on to um, the, the first slide, the first substantive slide, which is, you know, what is the public's view of how different entities and actors are handling this, this crisis? I mean, this is, you know, this is, this is one of the biggest crises obviously we faced in a hundred years. You know, what is the public's response? Well, I mean, what you see in this very first slide is that Many of the entity, key actors, entities get very high marks uh, from Americans, and this is true across partisan lines. Uh, and then you see the exception there at the bottom, uh, the news media, obviously very polarized attitudes about the news media, and especially President Trump, a 66 point gap between Republicans and Democrats on his handling of the corona, out, coronavirus outbreak. And I would say that that 41% total that you see there has slipped from earlier in the crisis when it was at 48%. So, you know, what you see over time is that Trump's handling of this is viewed more critically and it's viewed more critically by Democrats and Republicans. His marks have gone down among both. But I, I would say, you know, one of the narratives around this is this is a partisan response and in some ways it is, but in other ways, when you look at how the public is viewing public health officials, their own government, the state government, their own local officials, much less partisanship there. And of course, hospitals and medical centers get very extraordinarily high marks uh, from members of both parties. So we can move on to the next slide. And again, you know, no disagreement about uh, this being a threat to the U.S. economy. You see the new jobless numbers coming out this week. It's been devastating uh, for the U.S. economy and on a personal level. Almost everyone, you know, all of us personally, uh, my own family has been hit by this economically. I know a lot of Americans have and, of course, the health impacts. 
where you see the real partisan divide is on the health of the U.S. population as a, as a whole. Democrats nearly twice as likely as Republicans to say it's a major threat. And I think that's where the division lies in terms of how serious a threat this is to the population. No disagreement at all about the threat to the economy. I think we can move on. And this translates into differences over uh, how quickly to remove some of these state level restrictions uh, on activity. And you see the states beginning to do this right now. Now, this was a couple of weeks ago, but as of then, 68% of Americans said their bigger concern was that state governments would lift these restrictions too quickly rather than not quickly enough. And again, you see, see partisanship evident there. Um, it'll be interesting for us to go back and see how people are reacting as the states now are moving into uh, the phase of at least modest reopenings in, in most states, if not all states. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Now you see the comparisons between, these are Americans' views of how the U.S. is doing compared to their opinions about how other countries, including Germany, is doing. You see that to very positive marks for Germany, South Korea, um, not so much for the U.K. and then the U.S. And, and really the, the noticeable thing there is, is China, how, how uh, critical the Americans are of the China's response. And you see this this negative attitude across, uh, uh, towards China in a number of areas. Most Americans say they don't trust information coming out about the coronavirus outbreak from China. There's a lot of criticism from the China, of China's response to this, and I think it will be an issue in the upcoming campaign. Next slide. So where are we on the economy? Uh, you know, obviously this has been the biggest shock to hit the American economy uh, in, in, the, in the past 80 years. Uh, we can go ahead and look at this, how, how the, the economic attitudes have changed. It is really extraordinary. You see in prior recessions where you had this sort of slow decline and steady decline, you just see this shock like we've never seen before to the American economy going from among the most positive attitudes as recently in January to just 23% now saying the economy is excellent or good. Very different than the financial crisis and uh, recession of, of 2008, 2010. Next slide. And it's, and it's disproportionately being felt by those people with lower incomes. You see those last uh, uh, bars down at the bottom, 52% of uh, <laughs> lower income people say they're, someone in their household has been laid off, lost a job or taken a cut in pay. This is disproportionately hitting people of color, young people. You know, a lot has been made of the millennial generation, which is now nearing 40. But it's really the young people, the under 30s, who are taking the brunt of this. And for 30 to 49s, this is the second major economic shock, that shock they've had to deal with in their working lives. So we're going to see long-term impacts from this. Next slide. Now views of the president. You know, it's, it's uh, go ahead and, and, and next slide. You know, there's a, there's a broad view that, that the President Trump was, was too slow to react to this. The question is whether this is a lingering perception or not. Only 34% of Americans say he was quick to take major steps to address the crisis. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is a pretty devastating number for a president entering a, pre a general election campaign. 65% say he was too slow to make major steps. Next slide. But he does better, in, and you know, this has been a consistent theme of his presidency before the pandemic, that he does better in terms of doing, uh, addressing the economic implications of this crisis rather than the, the, the health implications. And you can see where he really struggles is, is providing the public with accurate information about the coronavirus. Only 42% say he's doing a good or excellent job with that. This is, uh, this is the lowest marks he gets. Uh, certainly higher marks for dealing with businesses and supporting them through this crisis. Next uh, slide. 
And then we move on to the election. We won't deal with this because I know you have a lot of questions about it. We can go on to the next slide. It's, it's uh, you know, this is, this is really what we're most interested in at this point because, uh, you know, predictions about the outcome of the election is not something we do, but we do know Americans are very worried about the possibility of a significant disruption. Now, what is a significant disruption? As you can see, this slide says, it could be anything, delays in vote counting, uh, possibly a delay in the election itself, although that's not likely to happen. But this is a really big concern as, as we get closer to the election, still have five or six months to go, but there's a great deal of concern about this election. And go ahead, next slide. And this has led to, uh, as, as you've seen in the American debate over the past couple of days, you know, should, should uh, Americans have the option to vote by mail? Should all elections be conducted by mail? And you see this surge on the Democratic side of support for conducting all elections by mail. And in part, that's a reaction to President Trump's just, just dire opposition to this. This is, this is something that's become a partisan issue. It actually isn't a partisan issue in the way it's executed across the states. You see many even Republican leaning states having success, particularly those out West, you know, actually conducting elections by mail. So there's an air of unreality about this debate a little bit in the sense that this is happening, it's expanding the options of vote by mail, but obviously Trump uh, is, is seeing this as something to wor that, that works for his party's own disadvantage in the fall. And that's one of his concerns, although there's really no evidence that it favors one party or another at this point. I think Trump's basic point is that he, he feels like this is something being uh, foist upon him by Democrats and Democratic governors, when in fact that may not be the case. Next slide. Uh, this is just a screenshot of where we stand right now in preferences across all the polls from Real Clear Politics, which aggregates all of the polling uh, I mean, you know, this is this is a pretty consistent lead for Joe Biden over Donald Trump. This has got to be worrisome to the White House. He hasn't expanded his uh, his base of support. He's doubled down, tripled down on his own base of support, but hasn't expanded that through the course of his presidency. And you're seeing that now. Of course, there's a long way to go. No one knows what the what the trajectory of this coronavirus is going to be in terms of health implications, and and. Truthfully, the economy is a bit of a wild card too, because as dire as the picture looks today, it may improve some uh, before the election. And what we've seen in, in past elections is that trajectory matters even at a time when views of the economy are negative. In other words, it's the direction of, of public opinion as much as it is the sort of uh, snapshot of, of where public opinion is. If, if, if the economy is seen as improving, even as dire as things may look today, that'll, be, that'll definitely be a plus for Trump as he heads to election. Okay, and I think that's it. We can move on to questions from, from now from, from the audience. Carol, thank you very much for sharing your findings and your facts with us. And I think our audience now has a lot to swallow. There were yes. some very interesting facts and news in it. Uh, but let me start with a short conversation between the two of us. My first question would be, we have seen a huge gap and divide as far as the role of media amongst the views of both parties, Democrats and Republicans, and the leadership and handling of the crisis of Trump is concerned. This is nothing completely new, but it seems that Corona crisis has brought it out into daylight and maybe even enlarged the gap. Is that true? Well, I, what's striking about this, the current crisis, and I think people always want to compare it to things that have occurred in the past. And, and the most obvious comparative point for the United States is the, the period after 9-11. And we all remember what happened after that period. The country really came together. Uh, President Bush's ratings went in excess of 80%. Trust in government uh, increased dramatically. Trust in the news media increased dramatically. There was a, a certain kind of uh, rise in religiosity. There were, there were all sorts of dramatic impacts. Since then, 
partisan polarization has become a defining feature. And you see this reflected in some of the attitudes, though not all, uh, of in the current crisis, but especially in these views of the president. Many presidents, going back to Jimmy Carter in the Iran hostage crisis in the late 1970s, experienced at least some increase in support, sometimes a dramatic increase in support in the early days of a crisis. That has not occurred with President Trump. He got a modest bump, it was short-lived, and we're back in some ways at the national political level, not at the state level, not at the local level, uh, being very partisan. And, and that is, that is uh, having an impact on the response to this crisis. We're seeing the crisis, the Republicans and Democrats are seeing the crisis in very different ways. Carol, you are following with Pew over the decades and years social behavior and, and uh, social, uh, let's say, reflection about politics, economy, and the way forward of the United States. So talking about polarization and divide, is that of a concern because even after Trump, can it be healed? It seems for us, especially for Europeans and Germans, something which is like a a society living in two different parallel universes. It is, and it, and it hampers, obviously hampers the response to this crisis, because if, you know, if you have a fundamental disagreement about whether the crisis is severe or not, you're going to have very, very different options. Do we open quickly? Do we not open quickly? Things like that. And so, and there's a fundamental mistrust, and you can see it even emerging now where in some states uh, people are saying that there's a higher death toll perhaps than the government is real and some people are saying actually that the, that the death toll is being inflated in some cases. These kinds of things kind of erode trust and then erode the possibility of even coming together on a solution. Now one thing we've seen is that the, the public, and I'm sure this is true of publics everywhere, they're just eagerly awaiting a vaccine as a possible solution. But even there, the distrust in the American environment is, is, is pretty significant. And you see it's a fairly large percentage just saying they, we'd be worried about actually taking a vaccine. So we're even to the point where the solutions themselves are divisive. You have been talking about the economy and we know since Clinton and his famous quote, it's the economy, stupid. You said the economy is still the wild card. And in so far, it's interesting to see and, and what you had on your charts that here in this question, at least Democrats and Republicans were very much sort on the same page because they both see it as a fundamental threat to the economy. Yes. So that was the reason why they reacted so quickly in, in putting together a bailout package. But will this cooperation, as far as the economy is concerned, hold? Well, that's, that's, the, that's the interesting question. One of the things you learn about uh, public opinion in this kind of environment is how quickly it changes. We actually asked a, a, had to measure extraordinary support for the first stimulus package. Uh, like I've never seen a, a kind of bipartisanship for that. You saw less support. We asked a follow-up question. What do you think more may be needed? Still 70 plus percent of Americans said that uh, another package would be needed. Now, this was probably three weeks ago. Is this still the case today as Republicans drag their feet on a possible second major package? You're seeing a lot of people hurting out there, but, but the real impact for, for the average American may not be felt quite yet because they're still getting unemployment benefits. The stimulus is relatively recent. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that second uh, package, but I suspect it'll be more divisive than the first, for sure. You mentioned and showed in your uh, presentation uh, the question and the, the, the conflict about mail-in voting and right. the struggle, uh, if that would become a major topic uh, in, in front or looking at the upcoming election on the 3rd of November. It seems that he has, Trump has overstepped the red line because of his recent, uh, um, his recent um, uh, aggressively aggressive Twitter uh, message, uh, voting or or aggressively turning against the vote in movement, seems to have backfired because Twitter itself sort of corrected him. Is that uh, sort of something where we could see more escalation on both sides? I, I think so because. You know, the, the idea of, of Republican charges of voter fraud, even on 
live voting, even in-person voting, has been around for a while, which is why Republicans broadly favor some sort of, uh, you know, national ID, national identity kind of uh, proposal. Uh, but but this has now taken on a new form. But what's what, as I said, what's strange about this this argument is that a many Republican states use successfully, notably Utah, which is a very Republican state, successfully uh, use use mail voting, and b the, the the people who are most worried about the health implications of the crisis are some of Trump's own voters, uh, who are older people, most uh, prone to get the disease. And so therefore, mail voting would be a, certainly a benefit for them, many Trump voters. So, so it, has, it has some dissonant uh, feel to this argument. It's, it's a little strange. But it goes with uh, the, the Republican thrust about concerns about expanding the franchise, which is uh, stated as a concern about fraud. But, but Trump has acknowledged that any expansion in voting tends to, tends to favor Democrats uh, rather than Republicans. And this has really been true in the past. The, the higher the turnout, it usually favors Democrats. Thank you, Karen. One last question from my side, and that concerns the executive branch. As here in Germany, we have seen this crisis like this one are the hours or are the hour of the executive branch. And Trump tried to exploit this very much because of his daily sort of uh, statements and, and leading uh, the, the corona crisis and the fight against it. But it seems that the lead, of, uh, the lead of Biden shows that it hasn't sort of turned out that positively for Trump. How come? Was it because of his many sort of changing directions and irritations or fake news. What's the reason behind it? Well, there was a certain fatigue, I think, with some of the press briefings. They were so lengthy and covered so many, so much ground that wasn't related to the public health crisis. I think at the bottom line is, is, is kind of a performance-based uh, evaluation. You know, the, the public by and large is, is not terribly happy with the way the federal government has performed in this crisis. And what Trump's strategy is now is to minimize the crisis, despite the high death toll of 100,000 reached uh, this week, and, and uh, shift some of the responsibility uh, to the state governments. And, and that strategy as well is, is not necessarily working because as we've seen on an issue like testing, uh, testing for the coronavirus, most people see, as a, see it as a federal government responsibility, that the federal government needs to step up and do more. And I think by, by either minimizing the crisis or tending to pass the responsibility to others, I think Trump may be hurting himself. Thank you very much. And now I think we would like to have you taking part in our discussion. And I sure. will pull up the first question. The first question comes from Ariane. Antal, and it does, it, it centers on the gender matter. And she asked you, Carol, does gender matter in your data or is it not particularly relevant in this period of time? It, it, it has mattered for the past 30 years. We've seen a gender gap for 30 years and now the gender gap in voting and party identification is the highest we have seen in, in, in 30 years. It, it keeps uh, getting a little wider Every election, it was wider in 2016 than it was in 2012, the difference between dem women and uh, men voting for the Democratic candidate. Women now are solidly in the Democratic camp. Now that doesn't include all groups of women. There, there's differences by education and race as there are with men. But the gender gap is an enduring feature of, uh, of the American political scene. And you'll see, you see it in the attitudes about the coronavirus and you see it in attitudes about many other issues as well with Democrats uh, enjoying much broader support among women than men. Karen, next question comes from Christiane Lemke and she uh, asked, how do you explain the different support or non-support between Democrats and Republicans concerning the WHO, the World Health Organization? I think it, it, very simply, it's a matter of uh, it's a matter of, of of elite messaging or or messaging from public officials themselves, in the sense that, uh, truthfully, the Americans don't know what the WHO is. Most Americans are not familiar with that organization. But the fact that Trump has has attacked it, Trump has has criticized it, 
I think puts it on the radar for Republicans and it puts it on the radar for Democrats. And if it's an organization that Trump attacks, I think some Democrats who may not know better would say, well, it's probably doing a good job and Republicans would be following a, a, along the line of their president. And so I think, you know, like anything else, I mean, what's interesting about polarization is that those issues that haven't received massive of public attention, you can find issues on which there is bipartisan agreement, but once it enters that political realm, you see the two parties divide. There is one question from August von Joost, and please open the mic for August von Joost, and then he can ask his question on air. Please, August, go on. Hi, my name is August von Joost, I'm a trustee of Aspen, Germany. Um, Carol, very interesting listening to you. I got the following question. Number one, um, is the president in the position and has he got the right to decide whether it is going to be uh, voting by mail or not? Second question is, will, is there historically an understanding about last minute's swings between the candidates uh, within or after a crisis? And the last question is, if there's going to be 200, 250,000 plus deaths. Will this definitely make people move against Trump? Will then the election be decided by body bags or are there other factors? Well, it, the, the, trajectory, the, the trajectory of the health crisis is unknown and, and, and none of us, Dr. Fauci on down, really have an idea. There's modeling suggesting that we'll, we'll be at 130 and 140,000 in deaths uh, by the end of the summer. It's, it's difficult to know. It, it, you know, that's, that's, a, that's an unknowable fact in terms of uh, the, the mail-in voting um, this is mostly a state issue. This, the states run elections in the United States. So what Trump is trying to do, obviously, as he does with so many issues over which he has little or no control, is build a message, build, a, build, a, build support for his position about mail voting. It doesn't feel like that's uh, resonating with uh, governors at this point, for the most part and even the public. Now, we only had 52% in our poll saying all elections uh, should be conducted by mail, but you have 70% or more saying people should have the option of, of uh, voting by mail, and this is broadly supported. And I think uh, there was a third question in there that I forgot what it was. <laughs> the body bag question. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, look, Right now, this is a referendum on Trump's handling of this crisis, economic and health. What he'd like to do is turn it into a choice between himself and Biden, and he will try to define Joe Biden over the next couple of months. I suspect at the end of the day, this will still be a referendum on Donald Trump and his handling of crisis. And right now, that is not working to his advantage. Here comes the next question from Angelo Pedroni from Rome, Aspen, Rome. He asked, if you think that the results of the presidential elections will be more or less along the lines for the elections on the House and on the Senate. Uh, it, it's, a very, it's a very different election. We've seen in the past, I would point to uh, the 1994 midterm where the Republican revolution, for those old enough to remember, this was the days of Newt Gingrich and the Republican revolution and the contract with America. And Republicans won the House for the first time in four decades, and the Republicans were on a roll. And two years later, Bill Clinton won re-election. Uh, this, I think you can take some lessons from the 2018 midterms. Democrats were angry. They saw it as a referendum on Trump's leadership, and they came out in droves, and they won, they won a great victory at that point. Uh, but, you know, the, the predictive power of these elections or these so-called special elections that occur, you know, off, one-off elections, limited. This is a national election. We're going to have debates possibly in the fall. It's going to be a major focus in a, in the, in a way that midterm elections are, and it's going to have a much higher turnout. So uh, there are some lessons to be drawn, but, uh, but they're limited. Let's stick on the elections for a second. Here is a question from Michael Backfish, former correspondent in Washington. Michael asked, you say Biden has a constant lead of 5.5% 5, 5 .5 or more. Uh, is it tighter in swing states such as Florida, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, or Wisconsin? Any trend there? 
it is it is you know it, there there are various ways to to measure this and i don't want to get too technical as we saw in 2016 the quality of state polling we don't we do national polling the quality of state polling is uh, is is not as good as the national polls and uh, that was one of the reasons why people were so surprised at the outcome in 2016 when trump won but you know so so really you need high quality state polling on an individual state basis to evaluate that question. Sometimes we aggregate all of the uh, so-called battleground states. Uh, this would include Arizona, the, the three states, the three key states in the Midwest, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, and of course in the East Pennsylvania, Florida, and a handful of other states. When you look at those states as a group, and it's helpful to do this, although not, not definitive in any way, you see Trump does better. Uh, he does do better in these so-called swing slash battleground states than he does overall. Uh, either his lead, either Biden's lead is smaller, and in some cases, most recently in a CNN poll, show Trump ahead in these states when all of them are aggregated together. So I think Trump does better in these key states. That was the key to his victory in 2016, obviously, with an electoral college win and losing the popular vote. And that scenario rem remains very much a possibility in the current election with, with uh, Biden winning the popular vote but losing in the electoral college. Next question goes to Frank Sportolari. Please, can you someone open the mic for Frank? Frank Sportolari, you're on. Hi, Frank. Hey, Rudiger. Nice to hear you here again. Congratulations on another great webinar. Can you speak up a little bit? I think your audio level is a little bit low. Oops. No, sorry. I forgot to pull down that stupid little microphone thing in front of my face. Now it's working. Carol, thank you very much for the insights. Let me, I'm just wondering, I mean, we have an electoral system with the electoral college that you could argue is in some ways less democratic than, uh, you know, other direct elective systems, particularly in Europe. There's a historical reason for it. We all get that. But uh, today now, particularly with all the gerrymandering going on, it looks like, you know, on top of all the, the, partially inexplicable partisanship, which surrounds every issue, we're also s separating ourselves geographically to a degree. Do you see that as very corrosive? I see that as an incredible danger. I, I mean, one, one of the things that you've seen in the current crisis, and we did an analysis, uh, we posted it on our website this week, and I think it does explain a little bit about the divergent reactions to the coronavirus outbreak that you see in the United States is that, you know, I think it's not a surprise people, people look at the mapping and see that a lot of these deaths, many of them have occurred in, in the urban areas, greater density, um, you know, greater non-white population. Um, but we overlaid that with sort of a political map. And what it means is that Basically, uh, most of the deaths that have occurred from COVID-19 have occurred in democratic areas. And I think that it helps explain, it's another example of what you're talking about, which is this geographical sorting, which means that this crisis, which essentially is national in scope, but is hitting different parts of the country very differently. And so then I think that helps explain why some of the democratic reactions are so different than, than the Republican reaction. But this is, a, this is a, a big concern. I mean, if you have a possibility of Hillary Clinton winning the election by 2 million votes, uh, the popular vote, and still losing the election, if this occurs again, it's going to just fuel more cynicism about uh, American politics and government. I mean, you would have two consecutive elections and three over the last two decades or so where the popular vote winner did does not win. Uh, the actual election, and, and that's, that's very concerning for, from a democratic standpoint, small d democratic standpoint. <laughs> Carol, one question from Patrick. He asked, what insight does your data give us about the extent to which media bias, and especially information bubbles created by social media is shaping and orienting the way people lean through this crisis? You know, we get that question a lot. You do see this increasingly, and you and we have data on that. And you see the people. Obviously, the biggest factor is Fox News, and 
and Fox News people, even among Republicans, Fox News uh, viewers, regular Fox News, News viewers stand out for their support for the president and there, to be honest, some belief in some of these conspiracy theories that seem to be, to be raging around. I would, I would say on social media, uh, Twitter probably gets a little more uh, attention than it may deserve. It's, a, it's still a relatively small uh, segment of the public, only 20% are, are on Twitter and much far fewer are actively on Twitter, especially about politics. But it does tend to set kind of, it, it kind of sets the agenda simply because it's used so often by the president, not just the president, by, but by news uh, journalists and, and uh, thought leaders. So it, it has an outsized presence, but it's, it's really not that popular in the United States compared to other forms of media. Here comes an interesting question from Ariane Antal again, and she asked about the independents. In your data had always Democrats, Republicans, and yes. leaning Democrats and leaning Republicans. But what about the independents? She calls them the undeclared. How large a group are they relatively to the declared? And what do you know about their opinions on the same topics you, you just uh, presented to us? Well, there's been a growth, uh, the, the, the irony or paradox of, of American politics, there's been a growth of the independence over the past uh, 20 years. More, more Americans call themselves independents today than did so 20 or 30 years ago. The problem is that those independents aren't really the wild cards and aren't really the, the, the they are, uh, most of them are as settled in their political opinions as partisans are. Um, they are actually very partisan. Why do they call themselves independent? Well, fact is they don't like either party particularly, but their views line up with either one party or the other. Um, you know, these Republican leaning independents, 80% or more are almost certainly to support Donald Trump in the fall and the Democratic leaning independents, almost 80% or more are going to oppose him. The small number of true independents, these are people who really don't identify or even lean with either party, is about 10%. Now, there, that's, that's a lot of voters. That's a lot of potential voters for one side or the other. On the other hand, a lot of these people are young. Uh, some of them are less educated. They're not as engaged politically. They're not as uh, kind of rooted in their communities. And so the turnout among these true independents, these true up for grabs voters, uh, is lower than among uh, partisans or even leaning independents. I see that Klaus Wittmann has raised his hand. Please open the mic for Klaus Wittmann. Klaus, you're on. Uh, Klaus, Klaus Wittmann, senior fellow at the Aspen Institute. Once again, at uh, Twitter, uh, will the fight that Trump has started harm him or favor him? And the second question, on German TV uh, two days ago, there was a program that uh, quoted Trump's posit positive statements on China's handling of the outbreak of the pandemic over several weeks and contrasted it with his attacks now on China as a scapegoat. Does not a great part of the uh, uh, American public look through that? Well, it's again the, the polarized environment. You look at those two things very differently. If you if you're a Republican or a Democrat, it's it's uh, the Twitter statements. It, it is extraordinary, I think, looking at the political scene from the out, outside the country, and you see there 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 does appear to be a bit of a desperation, uh, perhaps because Trump is looking at these polling numbers and is reacting, you know, with with some of these conspiracy theories he's been talking about on Twitter lately. For most people, you know, we've tried to get at this among his supporters. How much does this bother them? Some of the wild statements. The idea they they compartmentalize a lot of Trump supporters. They 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 feel like they are somewhat embarrassed and chagrined by some of the things he says and does. They they acknowledge this. We ask open end questions. What's your biggest concern? I hate that he tweets so much. I hate that he gets so reckless at times. So why do you still like him? Well, because he's better than the alternative. And in a polarized environment, you see this negative partisanship driving so many political attitudes as many reservations as Trump supporters have about their candidate, they still may see him as better than Biden or better than Hillary Clinton. And so, so the recklessness and things like that 
are acknowledged by too many Trump supporters, but but uh, but they they tend to look past them because there's a there's a binary choice. Now, as far as China goes, I think China how China emerges as a political issue would be very interesting. I think Trump is trying to put more of the blame for the coronavirus on China. It is in contrast, as you know, to his previous statements on it. They're going to pro try to portray Biden as as weak on China, I think it will be a challenge uh, for Biden because, uh, you know, it, it, how does he differentiate himself from Trump on this issue? I think that's something really to watch, how China plays as a political issue in, 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 in the election. I don't think it's quite clear yet how that's going to unfold. Here's one interesting question from Jan van Herf from BASF, and it sort of focuses on the health issue. On, he asked, is COVID health management itself an explaining independent variable in voters' opinion, or does it rather look like an influ influencing factor on other more classic explaining variables? It's, it's both, basically. I mean, you do see attitudes both. What we've tried to do is isolate people by where they live and how does that affect their attitudes? But even in, in say, high impact communities and low impact communities, you still see partisanship being the biggest driver. It's it, even, even in these highest uh, impact communities, it is, it is extraordinary. We've tried to control for geography um, and it's, it's still there. It's still a powerful force. <laughs> Last question from Michael Backfish, and I think we are all interested in what your answer will be. He's, you said that Trump will try to define Biden in the next coming weeks and months. So what would you, Carol, recommend to Biden? Just uh, not hearing from him very much at the moment because he's not commanding the stage. Should he be, try to be more present, more aggressive? Or is it enough just to wait for more mistakes from Trump's side? It's, it's, uh, we, we're not in the advice business. If, if I were, I might be making more money than I am today, but uh, <laughs> advising Kennedy. But, but Biden, I think, I think can't be uh, hidden in his basement. I mean, it's, it's, you, you, you cannot successfully, as, as we get into the summer and with the conventions and then the, the, the traditional Labor Day, September start of the sprint, the last two months of the campaign, he will have to be more present than he is today. And I think he realizes that. And I think, you know, again, I think the difference between the 2016 election and today, and, and this works to Biden's advantage, is that Trump is such a known quantity at this point. And he really wasn't uh, you know, in the same way in 2016. So when Cl Clinton was the known qu quantity, Hillary Clinton. And so now, now you have Trump with four years of a record to run on. And this is, this is something that Biden will exploit when he uh, comes to the fore in the summer and the fall. <clears throat> Here comes the last question, which I would like to pose, and it's going along with what Ariana just posted how uh, we are sometimes wondering that foreign policy and security policy and Russia and Europe doesn't play any role in American politics, especially not during the times of election. Is that new? Is that something we have seen all the time? Is that playing any role in the upcoming election? Well, the, the, with with the coronavirus outbreak, there's there's it affects everything, and so this is the dominant issue at this point. There's no room for any other issues at this point. And uh, I think you'd have to go back to really 2004 when, when the George Bush and John Kerry, when national security probably was the top issue and, and security at home, security from terrorism in the wake of 9-11. Bush uh, attacked certainly on the Iraq war at that point, which wasn't going well. But, but foreign policy, that was the last election where foreign policy uh, really mattered. In, in 2012, Mitt Romney tried to make uh, Russia, China issues. He limited success there. And so I, I don't believe foreign policy will, will, will be uh, a front and center issue as long as this coronavirus continues. Nobody should be left behind. Here is the last question from Mr. Schmidt. Please identify yourself and please open the mic for Mr. Schmidt. Hello, do we have you on? 
No, he has closed his mic, Mr. Schmidt. Do you, do you hear? Oh, yes, yes, now we hear you. Yes, please go Thanks ahead. Carol. Could we return again to China? Is that really an issue which could uh, I be worth competing about, knowing that Biden will be probably not less tough on China than Trump? That is at least what is my information I got from a lot of Americans who favor to take very tough actions on China. Therefore, I, I think, think the, yeah, I think the question is what those actions are. I mean, you have a trade deal and, and what are, you know, right now we're at the rhetoric stage and the, and the sort of uh, charge stage. I mean, what Trump would like to do is obviously place the primary responsibility for the coronavirus uh, arriving in the U.S. on China. And th that is, that's where the debate is right now. The question is, what is the policy towards China? Is it one of, uh, of sort of engagement with some limits or, you know, should we be more aggressive, more even bellicose? I think all of that's to be determined. I mean, Trump's tried to have it both ways, as Rudy said. You know, he's, he's sort of praised their earlier handing, handling of the crisis and now seems to be more critical. I don't think it's really emerged yet. The one thing we do know from our data is that among Republicans and Democrats, growing shares are, are taking a negative view of China. This is a partisan issue with Republicans being more critical, but it's coming across the board. People, the, the, between what's going on in Hong Kong, uh, issues with trade, and now the coronavirus, the negative views you know, of China in the United States are, are increasing dramatically. Thank you very much, Carol. And um, I think we didn't touch on the issue that uh, Germany looks so much better in comparison to other nations as far <laughs> as we have been handling our prices. But that doesn't mean that we are very proud of it. I mean, we are very lucky and our minds and hearts go out to you guys. And we hope that you all will live through this crisis relatively unscathed. So we wish you well, we wish you good health. And especially we would like to thank you today for being with us and a great thank you to Pew our great friends and collaborators. Thank you, Carol, for your insights. We covered a lot of ground and thank you to all the audience and please come back to us. This certainly will not be the last time that we will try to cover the upcoming elections and we hope to have you again on our program, Carol, pretty soon. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much. And thanks for all the great questions. Very, you know, the, the, I, I'm always surprised, but not shouldn't be surprised at how well versed people are in Germany on American politics, sometimes more informed than Americans themselves. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.